Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in Mr. Ryan Groney of Groney Capital. Before we dive in, I want to ask you a real quick favor. Would you mind taking an extra 30 seconds and heading over to iTunes to rate this podcast with five stars? This helps us get more listeners, and it means the absolute world to me. Thanks for making my day with that five-star review of the show. All right, let's dive in. Ryan was a student athlete baseball player in college and graduated in 2012 with a degree in finance. After graduation, he worked in the finance industry prior to getting into mobile home parks full time. Currently, his portfolio has grown to over nine mobile home parks, spreading across 400 lots throughout the Midwest and the Southeast. Ryan also serves as the director of operations for Buckeye Communities, where he oversees the operations of over 500 lots spread across mobile home parks in Ohio and Michigan. Ryan has been involved with almost every aspect of finding, running, turning around, and refinancing, selling mobile home communities. So excited to dive into your story today, Ryan. Welcome to the show. I appreciate having me on, Andrew. Uh, we've known each other for quite a few years now, and uh, sometimes we, uh, we, we're in the same space. So, you know, it's a good time to connect, and I'm happy to, you know, try to provide some value to your listeners. So, Awesome, dude. Well, I'm excited as well. Let's, let's jump right in. Uh, can you start out by telling us a little about your story and how you got into manufactured housing? Yeah. So, I mean, you gave my bio. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, honestly, out of college or in college, I read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, probably like every real estate investor or business owner maybe has, you've heard of or read, right? That started typically a starting point, right? So I went to college for finance, right? They really train us to, to, to work in a corporation and work on Wall Street. That's where I went to school. Uh, that was the goal, right? You get out, you go work on Wall Street and you work 90 hours and make lots of money, but you know, you kill yourself and it's not, you, you, you're basically a slave to the W2, right? That's the point of this podcast, Passive Investor. Um, and, you know, our goal on why we got into parks, you know, we wanted something else than a W2, more than likely. Read that in college, had that in the back of my brain, got out, had to get a job, got a job, worked for an insurance company um, for a number of years. Um, and then I looked at flipping mobile homes, kind of like a Lonnie dealer like you started. Um, I was, um, when I was living in Cincinnati, um, there were some nicer communities that were all age. They, you, if you drove in them, you might have thought they were senior citizens or 55 and older parks. Really nice. I looked at doing a live-in flip in one community in Cincinnati. Never, And then I looked at doing a couple others, like an actual live-in flip with a mobile home. Because uh, I was living at home. So I was like, how do I get out of living there while also being um, cheap, right? I was making good money working in finance. It's I'm a, you, you and I are probably a, a weirder person that we wouldn't, uh, where we've lived in parks or been in parks. And uh, so that's how I got started. I never actually ended up doing a flip. Um, I just, the, the deals just didn't work out. I ended up just kind of going down the rabbit hole of who owns these things, who owns parks, what are they, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I went to the Frank and Dave boot camp. Um, I actually went when they were, uh, they had some uh, protesters in front of one of their parks. So it was one of the more, um, uh, story news telling. It was back in like 2016 and often. Um, I don't really remember the, the news story, but like everybody, you know, pretty much went to the boot camp and that's how I got started. Um, I never owned any other form of real estate. Uh, I've never owned a single family house. I never owned a duplex. I never owned anything. My first purchase was um, with some partners. It was a 75 space community in uh, the end of 2018 in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. So that was my first real estate purchase ever. Um, I don't suggest that, but um, if you have the stomach for it or you have a little bit more risk tolerance, um, definitely move forward with it because it will change your life. That was my starting point. And nine parks later, uh, here we are. So, wow, dude. Wow. So let's go back to that first deal because I know that one had a little bit of uh, hair on it. So, and, and you didn't, you hadn't purchased like a single family house, no. nothing. That was your very first real estate yeah. Wow. Correct. Dude. Kudos to you for that, man. That had to be <laughs> a learning experience, right? Yeah. So, well, to, to back up even 
more kind of, I guess, putting all my chips in, uh, I emptied my 401k and uh, emptied that, paid the taxes and bought it with a couple partners. Um, that deal specifically had, uh, was an assignment. Um, it had a, it was well in septic, um, was like 50 out of 70 occupied. Um, the well was contaminated. It wasn't a chem contamination where the EPA was like fining the well. It just basically is a, it was a smaller infraction to where you just basically had to fix it. Um, so long story short, we, we, we took over the community. We knew we connect this, could connect to city water. We had all already done our homework on uh, how much it would cost, uh, what's the actual process of doing it, you know, plumbers that would do it for us. Um, we thought it was going to cost like six figures to do and ended up calling costing like half of that. Um, it was like 40 grand or about uh, probably 200, $200 uh, a lot, basically, on a 75 space community. So we connected wow. within the first year, basically. We connected and then we uh, the roads were pretty bad. We repaved the roads and then uh, we brought in 10 new homes and 10 used homes over the last uh, two and a half years. And um, that was my first purchase ever. It was uh, definitely something um, a little bit scary, right? Because you didn't really know about parks. I'd spent three years prior uh, just getting educated, tying up parks, but never actually going through with them. So I'd been through the the dance of due diligence and 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 I, I worked with other investors and other uh, people that had bought parks before. So it's not like I was doing it solo. Um, I had mentors, I had uh, other people in my corner that were kind of me walking me through some stuff. So that's the first thing, get educated and also, you know, find like-minded people that have already done it. So therefore, if you got questions, it's easier for you to, to actually move forward with the transaction. So very smart. Yeah. Especially on your first deal that, you know, you, you had so much work to do on, you know, to partner with, uh, with some more experienced yeah. operators. That was, that was smart. Uh, Ryan, what has been the toughest hurdle for you in the business? When I started, it was just not having any experience. So you gain experience after you buy a couple of parks. Um, currently today, it's probably uh, finding potential deals that make sense for uh, my own money and other people's capital. Um, honestly, it's, it's also finding good, good workers um, at, at the parks, good employees um, that will last long-term, right? Because they're, they're your on-site managers or your, or your staff is, the turnover is pretty high in most of these family parks, right? You're not going to have somebody that's going to work for you for 20 years. You might, but um, like you've experienced, it's, it's a, being in property management is, um, when, especially when you're in the front lines, is really tough. You listen, you listen to people complain all the time. You're the brunt of all of these people's frustration, especially when you're evicting them, you're raising rent, or you're doing other things that people just don't like. And people just complain uh, typically about everything. But um, being in property management is tough. And it's uh, t typically not a long career for, for most people before they transition into something else. So finding good personnel. And uh, over my three, four years of doing this, um, it's been capital as well. So, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a, that's a good couple of points there. We're having that same issue where it's tough to get people to, you know, to work right now, either they're really busy or they just don't want to come out and, you know, get to work. So, yeah. And in 20, like we're, we're recording this in 2021. I mean, it's, uh, you know, restaurants, we're having, we're having like national shortages of workers and all this stuff. And um, yeah, it's tough to find good contractors too, good HVAC people, good plumbers. Um, and then once, when you do find them, you don't want to tell other people because you want to keep them busy in your park. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, or they go somewhere else or COVID has been weird uh, with a lot of that because a lot of the smaller guys went out of business. So, yeah, yeah, it's tough. So Ryan, how do you handle the management of your current portfolio? Yeah, so I handle everything in-house. Um, I have on-site staff, which means um, on-site, they either live there, on-site property managers and maintenance. Um, most of our portfolio is tenant on homes, so we don't have a lot of uh, maintenance staff or contractors on a day-to-day -day basis, typically. Um, the on-site manager may, may live on-site, or they may live within 10 to 15 minutes of the park, and they may oversee two to three parks for us in a given region. Um, therefore, we can uh, kind of hire somebody a little bit higher level. Uh, that can handle a little bit more. Um, and then it takes the offloading of me. Um, so as far as like actual operations, I still manage the managers. I have 
uh, typically weekly phone calls with them. I, you know, I run our um, delinquency reports. Um, I, you know, I still oversee our books and stuff like that. I don't do the actual bookkeeping. We have a bookkeeper, um, but just given my background, it's just easier for me to, to do the actual bookkeeping. Um, and then, you know, uh, to say I don't send leases or I don't take resident phone calls is to say is uh, definitely, I definitely do that. Last week I was in um, three different states at all of my parks within a week. It was a grueling trip. I went from North Carolina to West Virginia to Kentucky and back. Um, hit all the parks. And, and when you're there, everybody thinks that you have a spend a lot of time there. You don't, if you're not actually like swinging a hammer, collecting rent and doing all that stuff. We, we use pay lease through rent manager. So most of our uh, actual operational piece is automated uh, to some degree, right? The revenue comes in, it goes in my bank account, it comes into the income statement. Um, and I, we just have to reconcile it every month. So we try to, and then as far as the investor relations stuff goes, um, I do have a business partner. His name's Miles. He handles a lot of the acquisitions. Um, most of the like phone calls during due diligence, because due diligence is honestly just a lot of desktop and phone calls and, and understanding where the city is, the market, you know, so that does take time. So we, uh, he handles a lot of that. And then he handles like the, the, the management with the investors, as far as like communications. Um, obviously we talk, but I handle the operational piece. And then he handles kind of like the um, investor portion of it. Um, but it's a, it's all hands on deck cause we're a small team. It's just him and I, um, and you know, we're, we're all helping out when we can. Um, and then is the, the goal this year is to really hire somebody. I know you just hired a COO. Um, that's the goal for me is, is kind of maybe hire like a, a like a, a regional person or somebody that's below me to kind of take the, the operational piece off of me. One, uh, I just, uh, one, I, I don't personally always like operations. It's a part of the business and that's how I'm, you know, getting my start, but it is, it does grow. It does wear you down after a number of times when you're doing these turnaround parks and it's really time consuming as well. So people don't realize that that's fairly time consuming, finding homes, moving them in, evicting people, blah, blah, blah. And when you do that, you know, across different assets in different States, it's uh, as you know, it's uh, it's tough. So. It really is. You know, it's definitely not passive, as we've mm-hmm. said on this uh, show before. You know, it, it's very hands on. And, you know, I think some people may get into this business and say, hey, I'm going to buy a mobile home park myself and it's going to be completely passive. I'm just going to manage the manager and that'll be it. Well, there's a lot more to it, as you know, Ryan. And that's why it's good to have a, a team around you that can support in different different aspects. So, yeah, hiring is is definitely important. And a couple of things you mentioned there, pay lease. We, we use pay lease as well. Love that system. So people can pay, you know, either with cash at cash pay locations, or they can like set up automatic ACH payments, you know, to mm-hmm. pay, pay rent automatically, uh, or they could pay with credit card, you know, online. So that's huge. And then also rent manager, you know, the integration makes it super easy to, to manage that, which is great. Yeah. Ask me at the end of the show and I'll tell you something that we started doing here with Paylease as well. So, yeah, yeah. I will make a note of that. So tell me, how did, how do you find your deals, Ryan? What's like your typical formatting for, for acquisitions? I just sit here and my phone rings, right? That's what everybody <laughs> thinks. You send out mailers and your phone's going to ring off the hook. You know, when I, when I first started six years ago, um, I was too naive because I had not owned any real estate. I literally had no experience. I was like 25 years old. Um, I'm 30 now. Um, and uh, when you used to send out letters, pe- the phone used to ring. Now it's more competitive than ever in mobile home parks, just like any sourcing of sales. It all comes down to your database and you have to have good information with your database, right? So we have a database of all the mobile home parks. Miles handles a lot of the acquisitions on the cold calling front. We cold call owners. We also um, ask other owners if they know anybody. And then just you and I, like we connect, right? We, I trade deal flow with other investors, right? A lot of people, um, I'm not afraid to buy like a wholesale, right? If somebody's starting out and they have a deal, because if somebody can call, you know, um, 20 owners and I pay them 25, 30 grand, that is definitely worth it instead of me picking up the phone and calling because the best use of my time is probably managing the portfolio a little bit more. So we're more profitable and then paying somebody else to, to do the lead flow and stuff like that. So I've, I've bought deals off of Facebook where I've literally, uh, I've messaged someone that was posting a home and I knew they were the owner. Um, maybe I'm giving up a little bit of information, but I message them. I say, Hey, are you the owner? 
Um, not necessarily interested in the lot or the home, but you know, I, I, we buy mobile home parks and uh, nine times out of 10, they send no, but I have bought one that way. Um, wholesalers, you know, I connect with whole, wholesalers. I don't know if you've had Jimmy on the, on the show, but I bought some assignments from uh, guys like him. Um, and then brokers too. I don't really utilize that too much, but mainly it's a lot of off-market leads through wholesales or direct to owner via cold calling. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I'm going to have to get Jimmy Johnson on because I know he has a pretty cool story with wholesaling mobile home parks and, and <clears throat> getting assignments. Uh, very, very cool. Uh, so, you know, for passive investors, we're talking limited partners here that just want to put their money to work. You know, what are the most important things that they need to know and they need to look out for when investing into the mobile home park asset class? Uh, they need to vet the sponsor or the general partners or the operator, right? Whoever that may be, because um, your general partner may not always be the operator. They may be, it might be a strategic partnership, right? Um, or if somebody has the deal, they might be a part of the general partnership. Just vet the general partners and then look at what they're saying in the um, the the PPM and the, what they're actually showing in their pro forma, right? And how does that compare to other operators and, and the actual industry itself, right? If somebody's saying they're going to pay a 15% preferred return when the industry typically is paying, what, 5 to 8%, there might, that's a red flag, right? If I was putting money with somebody, um, just vet them. And then, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's good to get on the phone with people or get, get, um, get on the phone with their team and understand what they've done in the past. Does this deal... Uh, fit their criteria, what they've done in the past. Do, do they own any anything else? Um, and then if you get a chance, meet them and drive some of their assets potentially just to see how they uh, actually take care of the stuff out in front. Um, that's what I would do. Um, you know, but when you're when you're investing passively, I don't necessarily have that experience per se. Uh, but I would just vet the person and make sure you, you actually like the person. Because if you don't like them at the end of the day, you know, you're probably not going to be comfortable with your money giving it to them. So that that was a, that was a really uh, really insightful there. I think the one thing you said is drive their communities and see how they look. You know, I think that's a great and and that's not possible always, but you know, sometimes it is, you know, from Google Earth or something mm -hmm. like that where you can just see what the properties look like. You know, I think that or even even if you pay someone 50 or 100 bucks, you know, via Craigslist and just say, "Hey, go drive this community and send me a drive-through video," you know? Like how, how cheap would that be to know, you know, if the operator's taking care of the property or not? I think that's yeah. a really good idea. And if they're not, ask them what's, hey, you know, I drove this property, what's going on there? Because there might be a story behind it. And they may, uh, they, if they have a bunch of communities, sometimes things get missed, right? Like all of us, we're human. Um, if you have managers, you uh, sometimes things get missed. And you also could be in the middle of a turnaround and, if they've also never owned a mobile home park or seen a mobile home park, they may not understand that uh, it's not class A apartments, right? So what it looks like bad to them may not actually be bad to you and I, right? So explaining that and just telling them, hey, you know, it's clean, affordable housing and um, it's it's not necessarily class A apartments where everything's super pretty. Now, some of the parks might be that, but, you know, my stuff is family parks, three-star parks, and um, we really just try to provide clean, safe, affordable housing and in good locations. That's our, that's our pitch. So. Yeah. Let's, let's dig into that. You know, what is your deal criteria? You said, you know, three-star parks, all age, you know, what else can you tell us about your, you know, typical mobile home park that you guys, you know, pursue and own? Yeah. So right now our portfolio has been primarily, like I said, two and three-star parks in great locations. So I want to be in the best school districts, the highest uh, medium home, home prices, right? I, if I can get a mobile home park next to million dollar houses, I want to buy that mobile home park, right? So our traditional has been typically 40 units and above in metros that are, you know, 50,000 uh, people and above, not necessarily one horse towns. Now I've bought uh, stuff where there's not necessarily a metro, but it's 30 minutes from, you know, that downtown area to the next downtown area. And it, it, these, these metros, when you go on best places and Sperling's, they're outdated. They're not necessarily up to current uh, standards on what's going on. So now I'll buy deals outside of that. I've bought smaller deals, but that's typically what we're looking for. 40 units and above. Um, we'll buy mainly turnaround stuff, but I will also buy uh, stabilized deals. And 
you know, the days of 10 caps and 50 units and city water, city sewers in a million metro is kind of gone for the most part, unless the park's got something wrong with it, like seriously wrong. But, um, you know, we're, we're open to, to different deals. And I've done uh, every structure of deals. Um, so I've done cash. I've paid cash. I've done bank financing, done seller financing, and I've done a master lease with option to purchase. So I'm very, very uh, creative when it comes to financing and closing deals. Um, I'm more about um, creating that opportunity and seeing it through because I have the flexibility because I, our investors are okay with that and we understand, and they understand that. And then executing on it, uh, you know, is, is the next piece of that. But um, that's kind of what we're looking for. 40 units and above uh, don't really have a deal size criteria. My preference is city water, city sewer, direct build. And five of our nine parks are like that. So. Very cool. Let's, let's jump into to value add right now. Cause I know that's one of your specialties in fill and so forth. You know, what can you tell us about some of the projects you've done? Uh, what <clears throat> value add components have you implemented in your current portfolio? Yeah. So the first one is obviously raising rent. If raising, raising lot rent, it's the easiest, right? It, and it, and it may not even be like you're raising at $50, right? It could be 10 to $15. Um, some, as long as it's, you know, above what they're currently paying now, you're increasing the value of your community. That's the easiest. Number two is typically submetering water and sewer. If we have, if we have that ability, we use Metron, which integrates nicely with rent manager. Um, and then three is if there's vacant park owned homes or vacant abandoned homes, we rehab those or we sell them off to, um, potentially Lonnie dealers or outside investors so they can rehab them. And then the fourth is we're, we're bringing in either new or used homes to the vacant paths. That's the most costly typically, right? But it also uh, gives off the most value typically because you're adding, you know, anywhere from 30 to $50,000 uh, per space, right? And if you have 10 homes, that's, you know, at the $50,000 mark, that's 500,000 of potential value if you value it on a per occupied space. So that's what we're doing. And then we're also upgrading the aesthetics, right? We're cutting trees. We're offering assistance programs for like, if somebody has broken skirting, we actually will pay for their skirting and install it. And if they can't afford it, we'll bill it back. We don't charge interest or anything like that. If they can only afford $25 a month, we will do that because we want the community to look good and we'll front the $500 that it costs to, to skirt a home or a thousand or whatever it is, because we know it's going to upgrade the look of the community, which then in turn, makes it worth more, might only be half a basis point on the back end. Um, but it, you know, you want the park to look good. And then when it looks good and people are showing pride of ownership because you're showing it as the community owner, it creates more value in the long run, creates people paying, you know, less drama, less drugs, less all that stuff. But we're also, you know, doing the little things like installing fencing. If there's like needed street lights, we do those, uh, signs, um, you know, things, little things like if the mailboxes are broken, fixing those, like little stuff that might not mean a lot to you or I, but um, painting homes and, and you know, spraying off stuff uh, to make them look cleaner. I mean, we're doing all that, um, but the actual money drivers, lot rent, submetering, uh, and then bringing in homes and, and rehabbing homes, so. Very cool. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think that that is very similar to what we do in our parks as well and <laughs> is a good plan. So. Yeah, and, and one thing we also do that a lot of people don't necessarily agree with, if we have dumpsters, we typically get rid of dumpsters. I don't like them. Even though they might be cheaper aesthetically, they don't look as nice, right? Because you're always cleaning it up. There's always potential that people come in and dump at night, right, illegally. Um, so you're always having to manage that versus individual trash cans. It looks a little better, might be a little bit more expensive. And then down the line, you may have the ability to bill it back or it might be direct to resident from the provider, right? Mm -hmm. Because why should it be any different than uh, a single family uh, community? If you have your own home, own parking pad, own, they should have their own trash can, in my opinion. It looks better. And you also can manage the trash situation a little bit better because you know who the people in the community are that may not, that have the most trash as well. Because if they're not taking out their trash, it'll pile up because there's no more dumpster. So, yeah, no, that's and it's not it's not fair to everybody else because I've been in certain situations where the trash is somebody coming in unloads ten trash bags and now it's full, so now nobody else can use it. So, 
Yep, I agree. I think one thing that just resonated with with what you just mentioned, uh, not just with the trash, but with your value add components, is that you know you're in that younger generation of operators, as am I, and I think it's just really awesome to see the value that you're, you know, the money really that you're spending to improve these communities that have so much deferred maintenance, really for years. You know, they they've been kind of just let go by the mom and pops that have just owned them and been using them as a, you know, a piggy bank. So mm-hmm. I, I love to see that, you know, like your skirting example, uh, that is a great example of, Hey, we're improving the community because we want it to look better and it aligns your interests, right? Because the better the community looks, the better financing you're going to be able to put on it. So at the end of the day, you and the residents and your investors all win by you taking that extra step to, to pay for that residence, you know, maintenance and, and putting on new skirting and then, you know, billing it back, like you, like you mentioned. So that's awesome. Ryan, here's a question I ask everybody, and this is a fun one. You know, what does the perfect mobile home park look like in your eyes? Perfect mobile home park from a unit count or just, it could be anything. Just anything. Use your imagination. The perfect mobile home park. What does it look like and why? Uh, it would be location is number one, typically for me, because the, all the other stuff you can either fix or uh, get compensated in certain uh, ways. Location is number one. You can't fix location. Um, all the other stuff you can fix, meaning um, you can build back water sewer, you can fix infrastructure, you can fix homes, you can fix, you can throw money at all the other problems, but you can't fix location. So number one for me is I want the best location, right? If I have a million dollar McMansions around the park, I want that park and I'm okay um, necessarily paying a little bit up for it because that the location is great, right? If, if I'm in the south side of Chicago, this is maybe a bad example, but I don't necessarily want to park there because the hood is still the hood um, and war zones are still war zones. Great locations and great school districts will, will even if it's a, a two-star park, it will trump a five-star park in a bad location. Those don't typically go hand in hand anyway. Five-star parks are typically in good areas. So the ideal park for me is a really, really good location. Everything else I can, I can fix. So Okay. All right. And you've, the- you've mentioned school districts a couple of times. So that mm-hmm. I take is, is pretty important. You know, how do you look up a school district and how do you grade that? Number one, I just, I just call. Well, first uh, I, I call like, um, well, so there's certain things online. It, Google is your best friend, right? To get the school rating system, right? Just Google the city, Google your, what the school district is. And then you'll get there's like grading scales that sometimes the state will release or just online in general, they'll rate the schools. Um, One website really have... we use that is called greatschools.org. Okay. Yeah. I, was, I couldn't cool. think of the name of it. Uh, I was going to say, I know there's a website. Um, and then I also just like, I like to talk to local people, right? So the, the actual city, like city people, you know, is this a good school district or, or if you call a realtor, they'll tell you whether it's a good area or not, because they know typically um, you know, realtors or other local investors, if you know local people, um, they'll tell you if it's a, a good school district, um, typically. Um, and good school districts, the reason I keep coming back to that is because I buy family parks. So at the end of the day, we have kids in our communities. We, I'm not buying, um, I would buy, but I don't currently have any 55 and older communities. So the school districts are important because the people that live in our parks want their kids to go to good public schools. Um, that's why it's important uh, and why we uh, look at that. Now, uh, if it's a bad school district, I'll, I'll still, I still own parks where the school districts aren't necessarily the best, but um, the location may be really good because it's on the main drag or the main street or, or it's next to you know the Walmart or it's next to a lot of big homes and it's still good location. So there's yeah. more to it than that. But yeah. Location, location, loca- location. I mean, that's really, your, yeah. That's typically. your thing. All right. All right. Tell me this, what common mistakes do new operators make? Uh, they underestimate the time that it's going to take to actually turn around a community. And then also when it's stabilized, what it takes to run the community. Not, and then, of course, there's a money portion of that. But typically, you can uh, back into that equation by calling around for quotes during due diligence and, and seeing what it's going to cost. But underestimating the time to turn around is I think the biggest uh, um, the biggest hurdle people get over because like you and I right we're full time so um, we can get to our communities 
at the drop of a hat if something happens. We, I, I can be there. No, nine times out of ten, you don't actually need to be there, but um, you can be there if needed, right? So somebody that has a uh, an intense career or an intense, uh, and then a family, and then they think they're going to buy this dilapidated trailer park and then turn it into a mobile home park in a matter of six months or a year because they're going to throw money at it, but they don't actually have the time portion or somebody on their team doesn't have the time portion. That's the biggest underestimate I think a lot of people make getting into the industry because they think it's like apartments where you can just turn it over to a third-party manager. And, and tell me this, successful. Ryan, what takes the longest? Of turning around a community or just yeah. the day-to-day? Uh, just managing all of the components of turning it around. So finding homes, managing the contractors, um, then doing evictions, following up with people when they're going to pay, if they haven't paid, and then also just managing the, the rules too, right? Um, seeing that stuff gets done, um, that's probably what takes the longest, but it's mainly just um, finding the good manager and then making sure they they do their job. But it, it's not a 40 hour a week job, right? It's still not, but things have to be handled sometimes right away, right? If if your manager isn't trained on doing leases or how to handle phone calls, somebody has to handle that um, and it still has to get done. So um, you have to be able to devote some time to turning it around. Um, and like finding mobile homes and doing sales is, is right now, if somebody doesn't answer the phone when you call, that sale probably walks out the door if you're selling up or leasing up a community. And, and same with, with uh, you know, hey, I want to pay. How do I pay? Questions still have to get answered. So that's the biggest time suck is just um, dealing with residents and dealing with your manager typically. So, yeah. Ryan, what hurdles does the manufactured housing industry face uh, as we move forward you know, through the rest of 2021 and beyond that? Stigma, right? A lot of people still have um, bad uh, things um, when they think of mobile home parks, right? They think of trailer park boys, eight mile, you know, uh, mess and prostitutes and all that fun stuff, right? Um, the stigma, I think, is still the biggest hurdle. Um, but I think people are getting over that as it becomes more mainstream from guys like uh, that have platforms and Wall Street too, right? There's probably an article, I think there's been articles in the Wall Street Journal in the last six months and and different money magazines that mobile home parks are uh, a great return on your investment based on um, you know uh, the supply and demand. I also still think we face a lot of hurdles from um, our own, like you and I, right? Just other guys like us that, um, or mom and pops that necessarily don't want to maybe put money back into the communities because they're always worried about profitability. Um, and they may not, they may cut corners in certain scenarios when it comes to, or they may come in and raise the rate, the lot rent might be $200 and they raise it to $300 right away. Um, you know, maybe that's the way to do it in certain areas or that's how, how they do it. But, you know, if you actually get out from, from your desk, I think a lot of times that's another problem we face is, we have a lot of people who are scared to go to these assets. They may own them, but they're scared to actually talk with residents and understand that these people are typically a flat tire away, their air conditioner going out like one paycheck away from literally they're living above broke, basically. And um, once you understand that, you can add some human component to the actual, um, you know, you owning real estate, right? It's all about the 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 resident. Um, that doesn't mean you can't raise rent and be, you know, evict people if they don't pay. It just means that understanding the human element um, of the actual industry itself, it's affordable housing. Um, so you have to understand that a little bit at, at, at certain points um, when you, uh, when you take over a park. So. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, how do you think a $15 an hour minimum wage would affect the, the mobile home park business? I think we'd have better collections. I don't necessarily, because if you think about it, $15 an hour, that raises everything else. It's the ripple effect. I still think um, every, if, if that raises, we raise rents because now people can afford more. Right. Um, and then I think it's just going to raise everything. We're still going to have that, uh, that Delta between affordable housing. If you're buying in areas where the medium home price is a hundred thousand or 90,000 and above, and you have that difference in affordable housing, um, even if, you know, they get raised to $15 an hour, it's, it's yeah, it's significant to them, but everything else raises with it. So typically, um, so I think we'll be fine. Now, if, now if minimum wage went to 
20 or $40, $20 an hour or $30 an hour, or people are making, you know, uh, cause I think the medium income in America is like 52, 55,000 a year. If it, if it pushes more, like where people are making like 40, 50,000 and that's the minimum and, and rents don't fall along with it, then yeah, we may have a problem because they can go afford, uh, the brick house down the street, but I still don't think, you know, people still need somewhere cheap and safe to live. So I don't necessarily think we'd have a problem. Gotcha. Um, Ryan, Thank you so much for coming on the show, dude. I mean, I really appreciate it. You, you've you brought a lot of golden nuggets for our listeners. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, you as an operator and, and what makes you different from other operators out there. And, you know, I don't know if you're raising capital or if that's something you, you, you're looking at looking into, but maybe you can talk about growing capital. Yeah. So uh, we, I am always looking for another deal in markets that we're in. I'm always looking for, I'm happy to join venture on uh, stuff, right? Let's say somebody, one of your listeners has a deal and may have some capital, but doesn't necessarily have the experience like you and I do, right? I'm happy to take a look at it um, and and JV with somebody, right? Or I'm happy to pay an assignment fee, somebody that's getting started um, and maybe even throw that in as equity, right? Um, and then as far as raising capital, um, right now we're not doing like, I don't, I haven't done any syndications. I don't have a fund or anything like that. So I'm always looking to partner uh, strategically with people that, um, with capital partners, as well as um, people who have deals. Um, so we're always looking, and I'm always looking to meet new people and meet people who are interested in the space, um, because passive investing is not always for everybody. It serves its platform for a lot of places and a lot of people. Um, one day, we, I, I probably will have a deal here soon where we syndicate some, you know, well, somebody like you might be a passive investor or one of your listeners might be a passive investor in the future with me. <clears throat> That's what we got going on. Um, I'm always looking to scale. I'm not, I don't have a overarching goal to own like 10,000 units. I'm more about opportunity and profitability and uh, creating a win-win for everybody that's involved with the deal. So. Very, very cool. And Ryan, how can listeners get a hold of you if they'd like to do so? I'm on every uh, social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. It's just my name, Ryan Grony. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you can put my email in the show notes if you want. Um, feel free to shoot me an email or message me. I'm on all the platforms and uh, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, and if you got a deal, I also offer like, uh, typically I, I spend a lot of time talking with new investors um, just about deals, about deal flow, how to go about certain things. And what that's gotten me in the end is a lot of free time. It's gotten me deals on the back end and, and other partners down the road. So, Very cool, man. Well, thank you so much. And I will put your email in the, the show notes. You know, thanks for coming on the show. It was a pleasure having, having you. Um, that's it for today, folks. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Would you like to see Mobile Home Park value add projects in progress? If so, follow us on Instagram at Passive MHP Investing for photos and awesome videos from our recent mobile home park acquisitions. Once again, that's at Passive MHP Investing on Instagram. See you there.